And let's go ahead and start our conversation. Um, I'm noticing as we start here, not only does Carlos have a uh, different background, he's also like larger than he normally is. <laughs> I think you're, yeah, there you go. I think, like, I think you might be right up against the camera or something, but uh, uh, Carlos, um, what's going on in your neck of the woods? Oh boy. Uh, so we we just finished teaching an eight week class. I actually taught it with Claire, a yeast metabolic engineering class. And now we started high throughput discovery and uh, trying to prepare for REUs this summer that's gonna be virtual. And that's that's kind of what's going on. What happened with the um the 400 applicants and picking six people out of them or whatever. Like, how did that end up? Uh, resulting? You know, it's, it's interesting. We have, as of yesterday, we have 11 accepted. One person turned us down and his explanation or their explanation was really, I, you can't argue with it. It said, I, I really want to learn how to do the labs, the lab hand on library prep. So I'm going to wait uh, and apply next year. And oh, wow. we have, so it's not a deferral. It's they're going to have to like, you know, brave it again and see if yeah. they're winning it. Oh, oof. And I suppose. I'm like, okay. And we have not one. how I would have handled it, but okay. <laughs> we have one spot that uh, hasn't been filled. I'm, I'm aiming for 12. I think we can pull 12 off since we're virtual. Yeah. Jamie, how are you? Um, tired. No, just... <laughs> Uh, classes are actually going fine. I only have 13 students in the class that I teach this semester. Um, I'm learning that their ability for time management is not, even if I keep telling them this assignment is going to take very long, they wait till like the two days before it's yes. due. And I'm like, this, this is a third of your grade. Don't wait. You've known about it. So that, that's been fun. Um, and yeah, otherwise, like we're planning on just being totally in person for the fall. So that is honestly a little bit of a, a relief because I don't, I'm tired. Like, I don't like these, this online life. This is, I, I don't like it. So I would like to figure out a better way to be in person safely. So I'm really looking forward to the fall and fall labs again, but I'm doing labs virtually this spring and we're like just starting that. So that will be, that will be interesting. They're doing, um, I, I'm doing uh, Amazon wish lists, so I'm sending those out in terms of what they have to buy because there's no course fee for it now. So we'll see how it works, I guess. And the the other thing I've been working on is we somehow got an, a new hire for our department starting for the fall. So I'm on the search committee for that. So I've been reading um, applications for the past like week, and it just makes me realize that people don't read the posting, and that's. <laughs> That's very, very frustrating where I was like, you don't even fit within anything that, so sh short story, but it's for like a water chemist. If I get one more, that's like water's a solvent. So therefore <laughs> fit. I'm like, I will literally lose my, like, I just, I can't, I've already heard it like three or four times out of 50 applications. And I was like, yes, I also drink water, but that doesn't qualify me for this. So, <laughs> so that's where I am right now. This is my, this is my little break from not reading applications. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, and Anjali, how are you doing? Doing well. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so, no, uh, nothing much. Uh, oh, I just answered my NSF negotiation questions for the ATE grant that I was working on. That's a good and sign. Looking, yeah. yeah. So. Um, what kind of grant is it? I'm sorry. It's a it's a grant to start a program in biotech. Uh, more specifically ag and plant biotech um, so it was a good learning experience regardless of it I get it or not but then I have an HSI one that I'm I'm really hoping should work but nice. uh, but other than that uh, I'm teaching a course in plant propagation and talking of lab and I just want to uh, echo what Jamie was saying they don't read the directions I just gave a simple model to interpret about the interactions of the different phytohormones and seed dormancy, and they didn't, they just went crazy. They did, 
didn't even read the figure legend. I just asked him to interpret it. So that's the problem I struggle with. Students don't read the questions. Yeah. And they just get overwhelmed because they, they're not doing the, their regular reading <laughs> until they are forced to do something. So that's that's nothing new I discovered, but in the Zoom, it, it was more fun. Yeah, I wish I could tell you that was abnormal, but yeah. <laughs> are, your, um, are your students telling you that you're giving more work this semester, even if it's like the exact same quantity of work they would have gotten last year? So I am making them read a lot, which is different from, uh, and I'm not giving multiple choice questions at all. I'm just giving more formative assessments and um, uh, I, I hold them accountable for their reading by giving them these, uh, these uh, group assignments. So, and I think I should transition completely to that, to the, even to the, when I go and teach in person because Again, going back to the idea of, you know, uh, uh, testing them on, on low stakes exam and on low cognitive level, memory, memory recall questions don't, doesn't go any good to anybody. So I just want to experiment that, just doing what I'm doing in the Zoom right now and, and doing it in person. Yeah, no, I was just wondering, and you know, to, to Michael and Carlos too, like I've had students not, not complain that I'm giving more work, but kind of be like, are we gonna have homeworks every week? And yeah. are we gonna have a lab handout every week? And I'm like, yeah, because it's a lab lecture class. Like I'm not doing anything yeah. crazy or like they're not even, it's that. And then like three big like assignments. I'm not even giving exams. And I'm like, I don't feel like, I feel like I'm giving less work, but I'm getting, as I said, not complaints, but like concerns about workload. So I don't know if it's directed towards my class or if it's their other classes are overloading them on work. So they're not I think that's that was my point. I think it's comparative. I think okay. um, and it could be the opposite. I think that some of your colleagues may actually be doing less. And so what your same is looks like more mm -hmm. to them. That's my that's my visceral reaction to that. Because I know there's other situations where people are really not checking out for online teaching, but like just decided like, oh, these things simply cannot be done. And then that means they the classes are just less rigorous, which means your class that stays the same looks worse. That's a guess though. Yeah, I've like never really gotten, I mean Right, it's it's a lab and lecture. Like you should have a lab assignment due at least once a week. And if I'm not giving exams, I have to do a homework. I have to assess that they're even coming and paying attention. So I was like, I don't, and I pared down the homeworks. Um, but yeah, I keep on. So I'll be curious with like course evaluations at the end. I was like, I can't do less because otherwise you're just not going to show up to class if all you have to do is a lab handout and then three assignments. There's no no accountability. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering, because I've read a lot of reports on people saying that, or of students complaining that moving online has been a lot more work for them. So I wasn't sure if like you guys had experienced any of that. Well, and I think that was the case last spring. I mean, I had certainly heard across the board when we were um, in an emergency situation forced online that everybody's gut reaction was to um, do a busy work assignment for each and everything. And so I think there legitimately was more work last spring, but I, I do feel that most people have adjusted now that we've had a year <laughs> to, uh, to think about this. That's not everybody, of course, but that'd be my, my guess. Anyway. Sorry, that was just kind of my question. While well, well, we're all here talking about it, I was like, am I doing too much? But it it's sounds a like an important probably... question. That's a good one. Yeah. Let me go ahead and pull up the paper. And I will concede right out of the gate. I was, um, for whatever reason, today's session is on my calendar. And I sent out a reminder to people for another meeting I had today, but somehow completely eclipsed out of my mind that this session was today at this time. So I'm just, I'm caught a little off guard in uh, starting the discussion today. So you, but you guys will prime me and get me into this as we go, I am sure. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, drawn to this essay as I was searching around for a pertinent topic uh, for our, our latest edition here. And this is brand new spring 2021. You can see here, it was submitted in um, September and then accepted right at the new year. 
um, the idea about the definition of success. Um, and this is an extension, I think, of a lot of conversations that we're having on curriculum, on everything that we're doing through the lens of equity and inclusion, which is not to suggest that nobody thought about it to two years ago, but we certainly have provided much more concentrated consideration of an idea of equity and inclusion than we ever have before. And what this paper does is do a meta-analysis. Basically, let's go take five years worth of research articles in CBE, LSE, and let's try to come together um, with a definition of quote unquote success. Um, I know this is something I have thought about in my own work because I have my own um, and a conflict isn't the right word, difference of opinion, how about that, with uh, colleagues of mine about GPA being the be all end all of figuring out success versus failure. Um, those of you that are active with students in research as well as with um, classroom teaching know that the skill sets are quite different and that success in the laboratory can be quite different from success in the classroom and that you can certainly have an overlap in the two, but um, I have tons of examples from my own life of um, the individuals being different that excel in each of those characteristics. And so what this paper wants you to uh, consider is the idea of what you define success as. And so you see here in this diagram, um, thinking about how research is done, how policies are made, things like that. Basically, what this is trying to drive at is however you're choosing to define success kind of drives the bus for all the other policy things you're going to do. And what makes this very interesting, just to go back to the abstract here, um, this idea of soft power. Um, I think this is one of those uncomfortable conversations for a lot of people because it's this um, revelation that you're doing something unintentionally, but that you're doing something that could be potentially harmful um, for your black indigenous um, students of color, right? Um, again, not with malice. And again, whenever you bring up stuff like this, you know, sort of goes back to the idea of privilege and bringing up thing, ideas like that, that some people uh, feel attacked when you bring these ideas up, but just the idea of realization of the way that we have traditionally thought about defining success and how that works could in fact be not considering the backgrounds and maybe previous experiences from which others have come. And they mention here, you know, as a conclusion, because results may vary school to school, we urge self-reflection and institutional change in our definitions of success via consideration of a diversity of student voices. And that's a, I think, admission right out of the gate that when you are looking at the content of this paper, you're not going to probably find a very satisfactory, oh, well, this is clearly how um, you should be doing this. So again, a meta-analysis, so here you see, we talk about 52 total articles and 21 of which give an explicit definition of success. And you see some of the definitions um, that have been utilized in those explicit uh, discussions, be it academic, persistence, career, or social. So let me throw this to you guys in terms of, first of all, your perceptions of what they're saying, but also, um, how you might go about defining and utilizing success for your own um, your own use. I mean, I guess I'll start because I'm. I'll, I'll think about this right now in terms of awards because I'm in charge of our awards committee, which we do heavily use GPA for. You're talking um, about student awards. Just student awards, yeah. So, which is also, you know, really important for their their success because that's how they get recognized within the department. Um, and we're actually trying to move away from that and do it based on uh, 
all of our students are required to do research. So we're trying to base it more on recommendations rather than on GPA to, to an extent. Um, you know, we, we don't want to give an award to a student who has gotten D's their whole entire time here. So we do, you know, hold it to a little bit of uh, an academic rigorous standard. But um, I think that it's hard because like grades, right, we, we gravitate towards numbers. So that's why GPA and grades are important. But then there's also the caveat of if a student took gen bio from one professor versus yeah. another professor, they could get different grades. And, you know, we, we've all read the evaluations of you want to take it from this person because you'll get an A. Um, how much weight we should really hold on on certain things like that. But yeah, then you have the problem of just time and going through and I can't read 7,000 nominations from students. Um, and even as I was saying, I'm going through now applications for jobs, you know, I put a lot of weight into the reference letter versus everything else that I see. But I would also like people to be a little bit more honest in reference letters because we just always want to write very positive things. And I know you can like read between the lines. I'm not very good at it yet. Um, you know, there, there are certain what catchphrases that are like, we really like this person means like you don't like that person at all. <laughs> um, so I, I'm trying to like, you know, learn learn those, those caveats, but yeah, those are also like really time consuming. So it is hard to think about grades and GPA. And as I was a first generation student, so I was kind of um, in the mindset when I was reading that was like, I was just happy to be in college and try to do the best I could. Mm -hmm. um, and while I tried to get A's on everything, like I was also just really happy to be in college. So I thought that was a really interesting mindset as well, rather than the non first generation students that, you know, want A's and everything because that, that's what is expected of them. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of had a lot of like mixed emotions while reading this. We are in awards season two. Oh, I guess everybody is since you have to make make these end of semester decisions. And um, I have a colleague and he's a very well-meaning colleague, but he, I don't think he knows he does it, but he distills everybody down to a number. And just, we go through this every year where like we send the emails around and we talk about attributes and things like that. And then he always 100% of the time defaults back to the person with the highest GPA and that person should get the award. I'm like, I don't think you realize you're even doing that. But, and, and, and like you said, Jamie, like, I don't mean to discount it. I don't want to give the award to someone with a D, but like, wow, we have, we have certain people whose GPAs are like well above three, well above three, not three, nine, but have shown so much value added in a course. This is, I don't know how many of you are sports fans, but the, the debate you always have in sports leagues are, we're going to award the most valuable player and you have to define what valuable means. And so this is sort of the same argument, like is the person you give this award to somebody who has um, shown you know, started from here and gone all the way up to here, as opposed to the person with the three nine that probably started here and went to here, you know, like didn't really need the extra help. And I don't mean to penalize the other person, but it's like, I want to use this opportunity to recognize someone who's come such a long way. And so. So I have a, I have a trick if you want it, because I'm in charge of all of it. I'd love so to we, we have a cutoff GPA. I think it's like a 3.0 for certain awards. So I go and take everybody with the 3.0 GPA and I just sent it out as a list, not in order of GPA rank so that they just have the list and then we solicit nominations for it. Like so they don't know that or something. They don't know who the top GPA person is. They don't know the three nine from the three zero. That's cool. Um, so, so if you want a way to get around that, that's one of the ways that we've tried to be a little bit more. And then we just, you know, hold weight to the nomination letters. Um, so just, Great just idea. a, a suggestion if you if you have somebody who keeps on doing that. I, I will take that suggestion. Thank you. Carlos, you look like you wanted to say something? No? Okay. Um, I do appreciate on this list persistence, and that might be related to sort of the 
little biases, frankly, that I'm expressing here about like, I really am always struck by those students that come in and clearly benefit and clearly flourish in a program, right? Like I, they show success, not by the highest GPA, but by just building themselves up in the most obvious way possible. And so I like I, uh, the representative quotes. If you look at the representative quotes on these four particular topics, in terms of relevancy, I relate to that particular quote. Success was defined as a student remaining in the course between registration and the end of the course and receiving a greater C or better. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that sounds great. Now, to be fair, um, I have no idea from that lifted quote what this paper was about, what the objective of the study was. So that definition is not always going like if retention's not my primary goal, if retention's already fine and I just simply want to improve something else, yeah, that's not going to be a great measurement. But depending on what I'm trying to do, I, I'm struck by persistence as a really powerful tool of considering success. Anyone else uh, on sort of, yes, please. I was just thinking about this because yesterday I sent an announcement out to the class and it had a sentence like, we're really invested in your success. And I sent that out and I was like, oh, Palm Journal Club. Yeah. <laughs> and what do I mean by success? And for me, it's persistence. It's like, I want them to, not that I make the classes impossible, but by going through it and by having activities where they discuss and create, I think to me that's success. And I'm more and more leaning away from, from really, but like a rubric with multipliers, for example, uh, detailed things and more of a okay you know how to do that let's move on next next thing or or you're not there yet let's let's improve so success in a way is is being able to improve and submit the final project Anjali how do you feel about all this yeah I would um so Thinking of students that I teach all the time, they are especially um, a huge minority population. And um, first generation coming from farm worker families. And for them, it's hard to navigate through their everyday life. And if they are able to complete their <laughs> degree in a reasonable amount of time and, and, and not take like over <laughs> more than what is required, like some especially thinking of students at two-year universities. I don't know, even it happens at students at four-year universities, if your bachelor's takes four years, because of certain reasons, students may not be able to complete it in four years or might take longer or switch major. So, you know, thinking of that uh, paper um, persistence framework that was written by um, Mark Graham and, and other people on the on the paper that science paper that I'm referring to. If you think of uh, persistence is a big part of of or indicator of success in STEM fields. I guess the question then becomes then how do you convey this to your students? I like Carlos's example of sending something out and then thinking about. Well, what does success mean anyway? Because everyone is bred, God knows I was, right? Like success means I get an A. That is the only standard of success. And so as you are um, presenting this in a class, as you are describing objectives in a class, how do you convey effectively and convincingly to your students that um, you define success in different ways and that success can be um, I'm looking here, this is looking at all 52 papers instead of just the ones that like literally say success, like the word success. Um, and there's some things here, we see all the persistence measurements, which is not a surprise. Um, and then the grading and GPA having its own 
um, section here in the middle, but I'm noticing some of these things down here on the bottom, which I think relate back to a lot of the things that Aaron Dolan and company have started to put into the conversation about sense of belonging, identification, self-efficacy, like the LCAS instruments, things like that. Um, how do you convey to your students that, yeah, you want to get a grade as good as possible, but honestly, what I want to show you here is that you can do this. Um, you belong here as opposed to, you know, you are a foreign person to this uh, curriculum. And I'm not, you can be explicit about it, I suppose. But like, again, I say convincing for a reason, you know, you can give a speech. <laughs> um, how do you convince someone that they belong and they are successful, even if they don't have the top grade? I think that's the dilemma. So very quickly, um, the idea that I convey all the time in my class is it's uh, taking a course is not uh, about getting an A or a B or a C. Um, for, I just flat out say that for me, the grades don't matter. What really matters is that if you're able to apply the knowledge that you gain here into your uh, workplaces. I try to relate it to their uh, ultimate career goal or the degree they are trying to seek. And I say, okay, if you're trying to be a plant science major or if you're trying to be a PCA, uh, you might wonder that why we have to talk about hormones, why we have to talk about pH and all that. But, you know, the idea is that you have to, you should be able to package it and, and solve a problem where you have to apply all this knowledge. So I'm not going to test you or defining pH and all that. But for me, it's all about problem solving and problem solving. Um, if you if you if you master the problem art of problem solving at the end of the course, that is what defines your success in the course. That's how I try to talk to them. Yeah, and I try to do the same thing. They don't buy the whole like I don't care about grades things, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but I know that one thing that I have tried to do, especially especially now that we're online because I don't actually see the students or talk to them, um, is I, I just try to make my objectives as clear as possible so that they know why we're doing certain things. And then I've really been trying hard to give examples of what is an appropriate response and what is not an appropriate response. I mean, I learned very early in my career that if you ask an open-ended question, that could be answered with a yes or a no. There won't, if you don't say why or why not, they're not gonna tell you why or why not. Um, but then there's different levels of the response that you get from why or why not in terms of you put a lot of thought into it or you just gave something very superficial. So I've been trying to do a much better job in my assignments and saying like, especially my bigger assignments, like here's an example, this will get you full credit if you put this level of thought into something. If you're going to put this level of thought, then you might only get partial credit. If you give me one half a sentence, then I'm just going to give you a, a zero for it. Um, because otherwise it is really hard because they don't know my expectations because they can't see me. Right. And then, you know, we run into issues in terms of like, well, why did they get a five out of five? And I got a four out of five. And if I just kind of have something to, so I've been doing all of my students assignments like twice, <laughs> um, just so that they can see that level. And I don't know, my first assignment was due yesterday. So we'll see how well that went over. Um, but just trying to be a little bit more explicit, but then also explain why that I want everything so that they, they have a better understanding of we're doing X, Y, and Z because when you go into your job, you're going to need to know how to think through this problem or to use this skill. I think they need some sort of justification. Um, I've heard the word busy work a lot, especially since we went online. So I'm trying to justify, you know, I'm giving you homework because I'm not giving you exams. This is not meant to be busy work. This, and just, they feel like they're getting a lot of busy work all the time. Um, but if you can justify why you're doing it, um, then it seems to go a little bit better. Yep. Uh, just one thing I want to throw in was, I was listening to one of this Erin's uh, commentary or, or, or she was um, giving a webinar 
And she said that we have to hold students accountable for their intellectual <laughs> contribution in their learning. And that's what it is. In Zoom, I think it forced everybody to be more accountable of what they are doing. Yeah. And it should be the norm, I, I believe. I think it's a great learning lesson for everybody, for instructors and students. And maybe it will help them rethink how to navigate their courses, <laughs> I, hopefully. Absolutely, absolutely. And Jamie, as cliched as it might sound, the whole real world application thing makes all the difference in the world, right? If you hear, here's why you're doing this and here's how it's relevant, yeah, uh, you, you get the responsivity that you might not get before. And I actually have a colleague in another class, it's a non-majors class, but does um, what you are describing there kind of sort of, which is like, oh, you want this grade, you're gonna do this much work. Like he's very explicit, almost like a contract, like, um, this will get you a C, this will get you a B, this will get you an A, because um, in that situation, um, you just need to know, like, you know, some people are good with just getting the C and being done with it. Um, and for other people, they want to excel more in that. And uh, having that explicit discussion can be a really good thing, almost like, you know, again, a contract. Well, and what I also, and there was a really interesting article, and I don't know where it came out a few months ago, which is why I have been more explicit, which I guess in the online world, students don't know how long they should be spending on assignments. Um, so you actually have students spending a lot more time on things that they shouldn't be because they don't know you in there. So I kind of explicitly say in four to five sentences, or this should not take you longer than an hour, because um, I was getting some students that were spending hours on something and I was like, you shouldn't be spending out or they're giving me pages of things. And I was like, I really only wanted three or four sentences. So I've been- That would've been me. <laughs> um, so I've been trying to do much better in terms of like, here, here are not only the expectations, but you know, I really only want four or five sentences. Like I don't, I don't want two pages of something. Don't spend 10 hours on this, only spend an hour on it. Um, so yeah, I think that, and I think that that will make them feel better, hopefully, knowing that I'm not giving 10 hour assignments where it's just read this paper and answer five questions. Like I don't want a novel when I'm done. I have a lot of these to go. <laughs> exactly. uh, Michael and everybody, I have to leave, but I would try, try to join next Friday. I really love the group. So this discussion and, and really helps me keep reading the literature. So I Wonderful. thank you for arranging this. Well, we'll see you next time. Uh, thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, yeah, so Michael, I don't know if you read, it was like a pretty well circulated article at some point about like the quantity of students were just spending way too much time on things because they had no idea expectations. Um, no, I'd, I'd be really interested to see that actually. I'll, I'll see if I can, I mean, it was just like surveying students, I think. I don't know. Carlos, do you know what I'm talking about? I think I do. And I don't remember that specific article, but uh, but I think her name is Barre. She used to be at Rice, and uh, they it's a husband and wife combo, and they did they created the tool for managing for estimating workload, and then over the pandemic they adapted it for estimating workload online. And she's at Wake Forest now. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it and send it out. Thank you. And so the recommendations, um, a lot of them are self-explanatory, but not necessarily self-evident. So um, the first one's so tough for so many people, self-reflection, biases, hegemonic frames, societal norms. And so what is it that we assume is default? It, it, if I go back to the um, abstract here, it just, it very much says, uh, yeah, the majority of articles did not explicitly define success, inherently suggesting quote unquote, everyone knows its definition. And I think we're guilty of that here. And so in terms of recommendations, we're talking about there we go. Um, that self-reflection of what all this means. I mean, there's a variation on a theme here, right? That when you design assessment, you think about what the goals are and you think about how we can attain those goals. So here, um, question two, what do we define as success? Think about the self-reflection in terms of like what's appropriate there, but how do we define success? 
and then decide how we're going to do a study, decide how we're going to design a class, all of this stuff in terms of meeting that particular goal, all this alignment that we always think is self-evident, but then like we screw up <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, thinking about your student population, um, think about capturing the perspectives of minoritized students. And again, this is written from the context of studies. Um, I'm thinking about it in terms of classroom design and implementation as well. Like how do I define a student as being successful in my class? And that could very well, there's sort of a, a weird circular thing going on here um, that a lot of people are just saying, okay, GPA is the definition of success. Well, you have control over that, don't you? Like, how do you grade a class? What are you um, using as your assessment tools? What percent of your grade is an exam? Things like that. So you actually have the means to define success by the things that you are assessing. So in that case, your GPA does in fact turn out to be an accurate assessment of success because you have made it that way. Now that, that utopian thing assumes that you have control over everybody's grades, which of course you don't, but um, thinking about it in your own class definition, I think that gives you a little bit of a really interesting framework to think about how you decide how you're gonna set up how grading is gonna work. Um, I like to make my exams um, not low stakes, don't worry about it, but like this, this test is not going to kill you, right? Like, um, I want you to study for this, but like, I want you to grow and build from this. I want you to be able to show me that you can do presentations or lab work or, or writing or whatever other, um, things that can you, we can use to show that, um, you've got skills. It's just a means of expressing those skills. So I'm drawn well, I very much to those recommendations. Yes, Jamie. Yeah, no, I think that that goes hand in hand with class size. I mean, you can easily do presentations instead of exams, but you can't do it in a class of 300. Fair. So I think that, you know, that has to be part of the conversation too, which is, you know, that great for, for a class of 13, but for, for any larger, or even like I'm doing book reports for my students instead of exams, I'm focusing on the quality versus quantity this year. So we'll see how that goes. But I can do that because I have 13 students. So I can read 13 book reports several times. If I was in my class of 35, I, there's no way that I would be able to do that. So I think it's a, a wider discussion in terms of, are we doing a disservice to having these three, 300 person or 200 person classes? Um, because then you have to do exams. Like, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to get it. And then you probably have to do like multiple choice. And then you're getting away from this concept of really being able to assess deeper learning just based on class size. And it could be, and I should be careful because, you know, I don't have the experiences that like a Carlos would, right? Being at a larger institution, but um I, the model, like what you always describe, Carlos, right, forever, I'm like, oh, you're at a big school, tell us how you do it. And then like, I find out that what you're doing is actually a smaller context in a bigger school. And I think it, I think it alludes to a lot of what people are doing, that there are almost always smaller breakout. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat lucky right because I teach my my biggest class is 32 and most of my labs at the, I'm trying to say not my the classes I teach <laughs> I'm trying to get into the habit of not saying my classes yeah. uh, but the classes I teach are usually 16 yeah max but it's it's intense because as you know they are cures and stuff changes every time and um, uh, Claire teaches 120, 150 in, in a 200, 300 level cure. And, and, and is that just one session or does it also break into smaller sessions from it's that one? Session? Six sections of 24. Yeah. And so I guess the million dollar question is I'm just thinking off the top of my head is there a way to coordinate assessments through those groups of 24 as opposed to the 150? You get no yeah, so so we have kids today, so she she ran away, 
but um you had kids and you had a mysterious man pop in behind you i enjoyed that very yes much. <laughs> uh, the grandparents are helping yeah. um she's doing something really interesting that uh they've moved away from and i'm stealing her thunder but um <laughs> they've moved away from lab reports and they started by breaking down lab reports into smaller chunks nice. and like graph uh, uh, graphical abstracts and things and now they've moved they're doing totally virtual labs but now they've moved into lots of peer review and peer grading of each other which is uh, something that I haven't I haven't uh, immersed myself in or taken that leap yet but it seems to be working yeah we have somebody on campus who really advocates for peer grading, I think that's dependent on the level of student. Like I, I actually, they do it in our gen chem too, where they peer grade lab reports once or twice. Um, it's to me it's harder at the lower level because if they don't know how to write a lab report, how are you going to grade other people's abilities to do a lab report? Um, but yeah, even I've strayed away from doing lab reports and that's just because I don't have the support to grade lab reports all the time. Like I have a TA, but that's still, I, I have to check and make sure that she's doing every, so it, it's still a lot of work either way. Um, I've been doing something interesting in my labs, which is I'm making them all hypothesis based. So I actually make them write a hypothesis for every single thing justified by literature. So it's more of like a mini proposal, I guess. Like I think of NIH proposals where you have like an objective and then you have a hypothesis and then you have a rationale. And I make them write that instead of lab reports. So they're like, at least dig it into the literature a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, they don't know how to write a lab report when they're done with my class. So. I like that and I've seen more and more of that over time is that people have been uh, providing more focuses to hypotheses and um, making that one of the big deliverables at the end of the class. Not that you have to pick between hypothesis design and, um, oh, it's <laughs> a new person. Uh, <laughs> a difference between hypothesis design and uh, writing skills. Mm -hmm. You can certainly do both, but um, there's absolutely a challenge and a time constraint being able to do that effectively by any means. Yeah, I mean, we do a different lab each week, so I could never have them write like do all of that and then write a lab report on everything. They, if they think I'm giving them plenty of work now, I think exactly. adding a, a lab report every week would probably just tip them over the edge. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that goes back to like the higher level thinking, which is, you know, the one and done labs versus the, well, you are going to have to spend a little bit more time thinking about things. And like, I'm grading you now on your ability to actually generate like a testable hypothesis. And then I can give more feedback if I only have a page to write on this for each student, then if each one gives me a 10 page thing, then I just don't have the time to give them the feedback, whether they read it or not, which is probably not that often, sadly. <laughs> and then the remainder of the recommendations here, we sort of have touched on, right? Um, alignment of your metrics with what you're defining success to be. And then Actually, Jamie, you just described this really well. Rationale, right? Justify the reason for choosing this definition of success. So don't just say this is what I'm going to do, but have a thorough explanation of why. And then I guess the added part of this, if you want to translate it back to a class, explain to your students, here's what I think is important and here's what I'm going to focus on in terms of assessment of you guys. Yeah, for like for my fall class, which is my like analytical chemistry, very, very well defined in the field class required. Um, I actually put in like a, a box, like the rationale, like they, it, it's very, very clear. And another box that's like, here are all the objectives that you should get out. Because I was finding when I took over the class, because I've only done it, this is now my third year. Um, I was reading the lab reports and when I couldn't find the objective as the person who was supposed to be teaching the class, I was like, how can I expect the students to know what the point is um, if I can't figure out what the point is from the person behind me? So I did spend a lot of time actually writing objectives, rationales, talk about it several times when I do my like pre-lab lectures, always start with that slide, end with that slide. So if they're not reading it, which is also highly probable, then they hear me say it. Um, but they, but they do appreciate it. Like I can tell a lot more that you can see things click 
um, if they, if it's clear why they're doing things. Cause yeah, it all comes back to busy work and it's like, why are we, why are we doing this? Claire, I don't know if you, um, having just jumped into this conversation two and a half minutes ago, um, Carlos was using you as an example on some, of, you actually have a large class uh, definition that none of the rest of us really do um, in terms of effectively um, offering um, some ways of students showing that they are mastering skills without necessarily having an A, right? And that's sort of what we're thinking about. Like, what all, can you just briefly comment, are there alternative ways to just like, okay, success equals A that you utilize in your classes? Yeah, so um, I teach a 300 level um, introductory genetics lab that enrolls about 150 students a semester. Um, which of course right now is fully online, has been the last two semesters, not normally the case. <laughs> um, and a 400 slash 500 level molecular genetics course that when I first started teaching it, uh, had about 50 students, but um, we're up to 120 this semester and that's also online. And um, I have really, just sort of slowly, but each time I teach each of those courses, I've been moving further and further away from traditional assessments and traditional grading. Um, in the lab, we don't do lab reports at all um, anymore because it, it really just seemed like what the students were getting from the lab report was how to follow a rubric as a checklist to, to get a grade. And they I never know what to do when they open with show me the rubric. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> don't ever really want you to do that. <laughs> and they weren't actually, you know, learning any transferable uh -huh. skills about writing that they could take on to, to be able to write something else other than a lab report for this class. Yep. Uh -huh. yep. Um, and it didn't seem to, to really have any relationship to being able to write a scientific paper or, or anything like that. So what we are doing now, and of course it's totally different because it's still a cure, but it's online. And so the students are um, growing sourdough starters at home with or without different fruits that they choose. And then they're sending them back to us um, to do 16S and ITS sequencing to identify the microbial communities and their starters. And then um, once we get all the data, everyone gets to share everybody's data and use it to test hypotheses about how um, the addition of fruit or, or other variables, what kind of flower they used or whatever might influence um, that community. That's really cool. Now and do they make the bread at any point? That's the other question. Some of them make bread, some of them cannot stand the smell. And so as soon as they submit their sample for sequencing, they're like, I'm done with this and they toss it, um, you go either way. But so what, what we're doing now in that class um, is we've taken more of a, a public science bent. And so they are um, blogging. So every student has a blog and they're, um, their blog for each week, we give them like, here are things you need to be sure that you, you talk about this week. Um, and then they get their grade on that simply by logging into the learning management system and attesting that they, they did it. And if they addressed all the things, they basically get an A. If they addressed all the things and they you know, can kind of talk a little bit about how they think they really made it extra engaging or something, they, they get an A plus. So the, the grade is really not so much part of the discussion as it, as it normally is. And then they're good, we have TAs assigned to students and we have students assigned to each other in groups to just follow each other's blogs and comment. And the TAs of course give more like feedback about, you know, when this, cause a lot of times students blog, not just their data, but like, I didn't quite understand this. I'm confused about that. And, the TAs can address that there. Um, so we've really just sort of changed our entire um, structure. And I'm not sure exactly what it'll be when we go back in person, but that's sort of what we're, we're looking at now. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I have to start teaching a lab in about six minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and end this out here. But that those perspectives are actually really cool. And I'm, I'm glad 
like we had a small group today, but I feel like I've learned a lot. It's actually been really great. Um, so thank you guys. It's, oh, dear God. So uh, thank you guys for remembering we were having this today. Even though I forgot to remind you guys, it means you're the extra prepared. Um, and we will uh, talk to you guys next time.